On today's show, the Dallas Mavericks start 8-2. and two. They're 10 games in. Why is Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving working this season when it didn't really look like it was last season? And then, Jason Kidd said after 10 games he'd know what the rotation is. Was he telling the truth? Do we think it's set? We'll talk about that and more on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked On Mavericks. Now back to the Mavericks, NBA champions. He hits It's good, and the Mavericks have won the game. If you don't believe, you shouldn't be here. Loyalty never fades away. Welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Angstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We couldn't do it yesterday, so today I'm going to let it ride. Thanks for being part of the show and making Locked On Mavs your first listen today, where the best way you can help us grow the show is to listen every day and to comment anything below. Let us know in the comment section, why is Luke and Kyrie working this season when it didn't look like they were last season? Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's 150 bucks. If your team wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And joining me today, friend of the show, what you got for me, Lauren Gunn? The vibes are good. The vibes are good in Dallas. Mm. I won't dare say immaculate, but oh. the vibes are good. Oh. <laughs> I won't, I won't say it. But the vibes are good, so I'm happy. (laughs) Absolutely are. Today, we'll talk about the rotation. I want to talk Jason Kidd a couple weeks ago. I asked him about, you know, minutes and rotation and how he decides who's basically going to end up being in his rotation. He said, we'll look at about 10 games. So we've seen 10 games now. They're 8-2, and and so we'll look at the rotation and see where we think it is. We'll also talk about why the Mavs' offense has been so good. But I want to start here. The national storyline around the Mavericks, the kind of the only one, besides like why were they so bad, was can Luka and Kyrie work? Are they not working? D- can they work? You know, there's many media members that just didn't like Kyrie and were like, this is doomed from the start. There's just no chance this is going to work. And now we're looking at this season. And they've been so much better together on, on the court this season. They were 5-11 five and, five and 11 last season when they played this season. Uh, they, you know, they're, the team is eight and two. Uh, they won the two games without Kyrie even, but you look at this team and Luca and Kyrie are just working so much better than they did last season. I'll throw it to you though. Mm-hmm. What's the biggest reason you think that Luca and Kyrie as a duo are working compared to last season? Yeah, I think for this season specifically, they each sort of deserve the credit and the props for coming into this season with sort of the physical and mental shape and space that they Mm. both need to be in in order for this team to be as successful as possible. And so for this group, I think Luca being in the physical shape that he's in and sort of even how we've seen him not talk, not talk to the refs as much and just carry himself and, and speak to, you know, his teammates and get guys going. And also Kyrie sort of play off ball and kind of step up when he needs to. Everybody just seems to be locked in and and doing what they need to do. And so for this team, I think having both guys sort of understand what they need to do and where they need to be at for this team to be successful, to start that on day one is a huge, huge deal for this team. Yeah, there was like a maturing that went on over the offseason. I felt like both of those guys just took last season on the nose, especially I think Luca did. Kyrie mentioned after mm-hmm. the Pelicans game, somebody asked him a question about, well, the, what's the difference between last year and this year? And he's like, man, I cannot wait till we get done with the last what happened last season type <laughs> questions, but it's going to keep following them because you know right. they still have not surpassed the number of games that they even played together from last season. So it's going to keep following them. But I think they took that on the nose last year, and they've really come into this season with like you were talking, like you were alluding to a maturity where Luca has not complained to the reps as much. He came in in better conditioning. Uh, Kyrie came into the, the season and tried a different you know ramp up method, and he wanted to be more unselfish uh, to much to the grin of the many Kai stands on, on Twitter, but he was, uh, he came in and just wanted to do the little things, wanted to play defense, wanted to push the pace and help it in different ways and help younger guys. And, you know, Josh Green even mentioned how, how well he's been as a vet and all that. And guys love him in the locker room. So these two guys, I mean, they just have been better overall. It's kind of a cop out to say, Hey, they just been better overall. I mean, Luca is, shooting really well. He's, you know, they're having to play less minutes. And so th- there's a lot of different reasons. And I've got a ton of stats that I can go through and talk about why. 
but they've just been better overall. Uh, you look at their offense from last season. When the two were on the court, when they shared the court, Mavs scored 121 points per 100 possessions, which is amazing, incredible offense. Like, that's great. This season, 125.6. So four points better offensively, which is kind of wild that they've gotten more efficient, but the offense has ticked up. Defensively, last season when Luka and Kyrie were on the court, they allowed 117.1 points per 100 possessions, which is just bad, really bad. This season, it's been 115 points, which is like not great, but it's, but it's also two ticks better than it was last year, right? And so if you go four mm-hmm. ticks up on offense and two ticks better on defense, all of a sudden that takes your net rating from plus five when Luka and Kyrie shared the court last year to this year plus 10. They're just outscoring that much more because they've just ratcheted up more on offense and on defense. Yeah, I think when you look at Luka and Kyrie and just their overall activity and engagement level, you if you're watching them on a night-to-night basis, you can see how night and day it is. And not just them individually, but the team defense as a whole is just it there's so much more communication, there's so much more help even if you want to put it that way. I mean, you've got a small sample size, but Luka and Kyrie both averaging over a steal per game, which is huge. And so a lot of that has to do with just them having a natural, uh, I guess, nose for the ball and knack for where it's going to end up. But you see the impact of Derek Lively and Grant Williams and Derek Jones Jr. Everybody is sort of stepping up and bringing to the table what they can within their role. And so for Dallas, I think when you have your two top guys locked in on that end of the floor it's absolutely huge and so and and you see it you see it against different kinds of teams and that's that's a big deal yeah and also you know the Mavericks are shooting 40 percent from three as a team which they have great three-point shooters I mean everybody pretty much is shooting really well but I wanted to bring up this stat because last season on Luka and Kyrie lineups the true shooting percentage which is like an overall look at you know what your team is shooting they shot 64 percent and uh, they shot 64% this year. This Last season, they shot 63%. So, like, they're not even... It's not like that they're sh- they're shooting the lights out and they're, they're destroying. Like, they've mm-hmm. actually gotten better in certain areas. This is not, like, a fluke that the offense is this much better because they've, they've done things like push the pace. Last season, when Luke and Kyrie were on the court, they had, like, 99 possessions a game. That's basically what pace is. If you ever see the number of pace, it's, like, you know, 100, 101. It's the possessions per game, essentially. 99 last season this year it's 103.6 so it's like four four possessions more a game and those four possessions matter a ton with with pace where have you seen the Mavericks and especially Luka and Kyrie lineups where have you seen them push the pace Mm -hmm. a little yeah I think we all sort of expect Kyrie to play with with pace and his skills in the open floor everybody Mm -hmm. sort of expects that but also Luka getting the ball and always eyes up the floor and and sometimes I mean even last night in last night's game you saw him overthrow I think it was Kyrie on a on a uh, on a transition play and and you're just you always see them looking I think the area was that the the one where he like jogged over to the bench What'd you say? I missed it. What'd you say? Well, did you was that the one where he jogged over to the bench after he overthrew that pass that he was like so yeah. embarrassed that he just like checked himself out of the game? I don't know if you saw it on the broadcast, but I was sitting like right in front of it. Luca threw that pass <laughs> and then did this little walk where it was like he had his he like was bending down to the ground where like his butt was closer to the ground and then he stiff <laughs> he like stiff armed like a toy soldier, like ran to the bench. He was so embarrassed. It was oh so my. funny. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen him overthrow someone like that. So the whole thing was he bizarre had to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was just like, what? But yeah, but I mean, I think the areas where you see it sort of impact the team most is where you see Tim Hardaway Jr. and mm. Grant Williams with their transition catch and shoot threes, who, uh, like you said, and you mentioned, ev- the team is shooting very well from three, but those transition threes, are they're not easy looks. And so those, but also Jaden Hardy, Josh Green, even Dante Exum getting out and running, it's huge. And so for this team, for them to have the half court success, but also the ability to play with pace and even guys finishing who I think some at sometimes Tim Hardaway Jr., Josh Green specifically have, have had some struggles finishing. But I think over time, you'll see an improvement there. And, and with this team's ability to just get out on the floor and run compared to last season, you mm-hmm. have to at least applaud and recognize the improvement from there. Yeah, you absolutely do. It, they've been better. And honestly, uh, Statistically, they've been playing less together, which is kind of funny. Last season, they played about 27.8 minutes a game last year, and this year it's 21.9 minutes a game. Like, they're playing a lot less, but because they haven't had to play some fourth quarters, so that's Mm -hmm. a big difference between that. But they're playing less because they're just playing more efficiently overall. I think it's just been the best of what anyone could expect. Coming up, let's talk about a couple more things. I want to talk about how Derek Lively has affected These two, because the defense when he's on the court with them and off the court with them is wild. You have to hear about it. We'll talk about that. Coming up.
Today's episode is brought to you by Ibotta. Ibotta has you covered if you go to the grocery store. How could you not go to the grocery store? I mean, the prices on everything are so expensive everywhere else. You've got to make your own food at times. And you know Thanksgiving is coming up. My wife was scheduling and buying a bunch of stuff and asking me if I want this or if we want this or what do you want to make and all that. Ibotta's here to give you cash back on all that stuff when you make your Thanksgiving feast because... Who wants turkey without the gravy and without the stuffing and without the cranberry sauce and without all that kind of stuff? Starting November 1st for the fourth year in a row, Ibotta is giving 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving feast. Just add in the offers to the app and redeem for everything you need to make your Thanksgiving meal complete. All you have to do is shop at your favorite retailers and upload your receipt. Download the Ibotta app now and use the code LOCK to get 100% cash back on your Thanksgiving dinner starting November 1st. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store, download the free Ibotta app and use the code LOCK. That's Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A, just like on the Pelicans jerseys. They're the jersey sponsor. The uh, CEO or the president of Ibotta went up to Jake Madison and said that he listens to Locked On Pelicans every day. Pretty cool. Again, Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store. Use the code LOCKED. Uh oh, guess what day it is? Thanks everybody for hanging out with us on Lockdown Maps, being part of the show, part of the Raccoon Squad, listening every day. We appreciate you. If you want to support the show, get text alerts from me on all kinds of map stuff, in game thoughts. I'll send you rumors if we see them on anywhere. If anybody posts a rumor anywhere online, I'm going to find it and I will text it right to your phone, do all that kind of stuff. Subscribe to Subtext and uh, it helps support the show. Click the link in the description or text the number on the screen. All right, Lauren. We've been talking about Luca and Kyrie and something that I discovered as I was honestly sitting in the airport this morning, uh, leaving New Orleans and was just like had an hour to, because I thought that security would take a lot longer than it did. Don't believe everything you see on Twitter. I, th- I should have just, I should have, I should have known that and should have learned that already in my life. But the defense with Derek Lively on the court with Luca and Kyrie, because we've been talking about Luca and Kyrie, why they've been better. Well, the defense has been better in part because of how good Derek Lively has been. Derek Lively, and I tweeted this. You can go check out the graphic. I posted it on Instagram as well, at Nick Van Exit everywhere. Uh, the Mavericks offense with, with Luka Doncic, Kyrie Irving, and then Derek Lively, either on or off, is like 125 points per 100 possessions, 126 points per 100 possessions. The offense doesn't really change whether Lively is on the court with them or not. What does change significantly is the defense. When Derek Lively II is on the court with Luka and Kyrie, they allow 109.3 points per 100 possessions. That's like a top five defense in the NBA right now. That That is a really, really good defense. When he's off the court, they allow 124.5 points per 100 possessions, which is like, honestly, the worst defense in the NBA. So literally, they go from a top five defense when he's on the court with them to the worst defense in the NBA when he's off the court with them. It's not just Dwight Powell. Lauren Gunn, tell me why, <laughs> tell me why that's <laughs> such a big split. <laughs> You know, I think obviously the athleticism and the size, one of the most underrated things about Derek Lively that whether, you know, wherever he was at coming into this season, one thing that you could see in his game is his ability to move his feet at the size that he's at. And so whether, however you feel about him putting on muscle or putting on weight, whatever, you can see him, his ability to move those feet mixed with the wingspan. And so when you're watching this team, if you watch opposing teams, how many times it's not even just the shot blocking, but if you watch how many teams start to drive and he just takes one step over and they start to maybe rethink that decision Mm. a little bit and they look and kick it back out or, or or stop their dribble or, or it just completely changes sort of the attack uh, for opposing teams. And so for, for Dallas, that's absolutely, absolutely huge because we saw specifically in the Raptors game, what it's like, when you're sort of physically outmatched in terms of size. And so having Derek Lively and having just the deterrent factor that he brings is just monumental, whether he's getting the blocks or not, his presence alone is something that this team has really, really needed. And now it looks like they have it. Just having a big guy that has that wingspan, that has that size. I mean, just as the difference, I mean, we've seen, Dwight struggle. We've seen Maxi struggle. Some of those numbers, by the way, are with Max. Just Maxi as the center. Some of those are Mavs playing small ball. So like, it's a lot on Dwight Powell and the difference between Derek Lively and Dwight. You know, I won't, I won't <laughs> lie about that. But just having that big guy and also him to fight for rebounds. I mean, he he hasn't oh, had. Yeah. He doesn't get a ton a ton of rebounds. Like you're not looking at him like the next you know self proclaimed best rebounder in NBA history, Andre Drummond. Like you're not comparing him to to him <laughs> just yet. But he 
he fights for them. And when you have a seven footer like that, that can at least get to some balls. Like there are some, there are some plays on the Pelicans game the other night where I was like, Oh, Jonas Valanciunas would get that if somebody else was on the court, but lively is there to at least just tap it to somebody else or to fight for it so that Jonas doesn't get it. And then the Mavericks have a chance to like, you know, bunch around it and get it. And so I just think those little plays make such a big difference. And then you're right. The, Deterring to go to the rim, the contesting at the rim, even his fouls, like even his fouls stop mm-hmm. plays. Whereas before, or it, with other players, or with playing small ball or whatever, maybe they finish that play and still foul them, right? Like <laughs> even just those, like, at least his fouls stop the action from happening. And so yeah. he's been such a big difference. Um, the the Mavericks, by the way, their defense. So they're, when their defense has been a little bit better with Luca and Kyrie on the court, their defensive free throw rate is down. So they're like fouling to to get free throws less than they were last season. Their defensive turnover rate, so they're getting more turnovers, which I think Lively is a part of. He's gotten some more steals than I expected him to. He had a couple last mm-hmm. night. One of them led to one of those big outlet passes that you talked about. Oh, yeah. But Lively has just really changed, <laughs> like really changed what they can be because they just have a big, rolling, like competent center in there. Mm-hmm. And they're top five defense when he plays with Luka and Kyrie and the worst defense when he doesn't play with them. It's been <laughs> wild to look at. Yeah, it, it is wild. And it's it's one of those things where it's like it passes the eye test. You can just see yeah. the, the impact, but also what he does and the improvement on a game to game basis. I mean, the, the biggest thing right now is just adjusting to the, the pace and the foul trouble. And I feel like we've seen some improvement again, small sample size. You can't necessarily jump to any sort of conclusions there, oh, but even know. just his reaction time. I feel like there are there are points where it's like, OK, he's coming over to help other times or even in the pick and roll. I feel like there are moments where it's like, okay, he he w- he missed that last game, and here he is not missing it. And so it, it's very small things, and I think overall consistency will be key over time. But there are there are moments where I'm like, okay, I remember a specific moment where he he missed that read last game, and here it is, here he is making it. So um, sometimes obviously those things are matchup based, but you have so much like to hang your hat on with him. He just looks yeah. like so such a such a quick learner um on a night to night basis and I really enjoy watching it. So, we'll see. It's been amazing to watch him. Like just the place where he's starting uh you know, 8 8.8 8 points, just about 7 rebounds and assist, a block a game. Like he's just been you know, so good in that in that role and exactly exactly what they needed. Just just that He's kind of what we wanted JaVale McGee to be last year. Can you just play like 18 <laughs> minutes a game and just block something, get some rebounds and catch some lobs? And JaVale was like, no, I'd rather like post up and do weird stuff where I <laughs> hold the ball with one hand and like, you know, spin around with it and try to dunk over somebody just and then make Luca really mad about it. Like That was the difference between this year and oh, this year and last year so God. far. Uh, oh, my gosh. I can't believe that that was a whole thing. <laughs> that existed. Oh, my gosh. Do I still have the drop on here? No, I took it off. Finally, no more JaVale <sighs> McGee drop. That's fine. He's been great. I also want to say this. The Mavericks start is, by the way, one of the best starts in franchise history to a season. They've started eight and two or better five times now. We don't know how they finished this season, but back in 2006, they started eight and two. That team went to the finals and should have won a finals of t- a, a title. We won't talk about that one. So they went to the finals one year. They went to the second round. In 2005, in 2008, they were in the first round and then lost in that one. And then in 2003, they started 10 and 0. I think they actually started 14 and 0 total, and they went to the conference finals in that one. Uh, your thoughts on the Mavericks start so far, and the fact that every single team, Mavericks team that has started this great, has made the playoffs and even most of them advance. I mean, it's so hard. And there's no there's no argument to not buy into this team. I know some people are like, oh, you know, they haven't really had any tough matchups. And the one that they had against Denver, they lost. And it's like, OK, y- winning eight out of 10 games, there's so much that has to go into that for and, and you can't that's not a fluke. And so for this team, for all the reasons that we've mentioned, the pace, the strong shooting, the team defense, the individual play, there's so, so much that they have come right out of the gates just firing on all cylinders. And so for this team, I mean, I'm bought in. I'm excited about what they can do. I have no idea what to expect next, but I'm I'm excited with what we've seen so far. Uh, and I feel like a lot of questions that I had over the offseason with what the rotation would look like, what certain guys are going to be capable of doing, what we're actually seeing them doing. A lot of those questions have, I've been pleasantly surprised by the reality of those answers. 
I will say sometimes like it, it, like it winning eight out of 10 can be a fluke. The Mavericks did it last year in, de- in December. So there is that, but the things that you're talking about are sustainable. Like there's sustainable yeah. things that the Mavericks could continue. There wasn't, that was a really easy stretch of the schedule last season when they won, they won seven in a row at that point. Uh-huh. Uh, and everyone was, was saying Christian Wood w- was the answer. And now these are more sustainable <laughs> things, right? I, I have more trust that Kyrie being the second best player is going to take this team farther than if Christian <laughs> Wood is the second best player at this point. Uh, <laughs> right. And maybe that will be the last time we bag on Christian Wood on this podcast, but I can't promise anything. Can't yeah, I be. doubt it. <laughs> Coming up, I want to talk about the rotation and if the rotation is set, because Jason Kidd said after 10 games. And so let's talk about after 10 games. We'll get into that. Coming up. Oh, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel Sportsbook has you covered with all kinds of props and odds and lines and all that good stuff to check out through the NBA season, NFL season still going on, and new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. So check it out. See what you can get. Uh, let's see if they have the Mavericks game on there. They should because they do. Mavericks, four-point favorite against the Pelicans. So it's like, you know, a pretty good favorite. Not slight, but it's definitely over, especially with the Pelicans being home. So if you want to put down on the money line, the Mavericks are minus 172 on the money line. So you put down five bucks on that, you can win 150 bucks on it in the bonus bets with FanDuel. So again, check out FanDuel.com slash locked on. Put some money down on a money line, and then you could get $150 in bonus bets. All kinds of other stuff too. It doesn't have to just stick with NBA. You can do NFL. You can do uh, futures for MLB, all kinds of other stuff. Check it out. FanDuel.com slash Locked on. Take that with you. All right, Lauren, let's talk about the Mavs rotation. A couple weeks ago, I asked Jason Kidd about the rotation, and he said, you know, about 10 games. 10 games we'll figure out. And usually Jason Kidd doesn't tell you things. So when he does tell you things, I try to take it seriously and, and say that, all right, let's take him at his word at this. Right now, the Dallas Mavericks rotation, if you're just looking at, all right, who's the top player's in the Mavs rotation. Right now, I'm looking at Luka, Kyrie, Grant Williams. That's like that's like your top guys. Tim Hardaway is like now your fourth guy, basically. he He's played 28 minutes a game and is going to play. I mean, I was, I was trying to warn everybody. He's going to play. Uh, even I under underestimated how much he was going to play. He's going to play a lot. <laughs> Josh Green is next at 25 minutes. Some of these are skewed because of injuries and things like that. Derek Lively at 24 minutes a game. Derek Jones Jr., 22 minutes a game. Maxi Kleba at 18. Dwight Powell about 18. And then you've got Jaden Hardy, who's kind of a swing guy, but he's settled into a role with about 12 minutes a game. And then you've got Dante Exum, who's kind of been in and out. you got Seth Curry, who's been in and out. And then you've got Rashawn Holmes, Omax, and Markeith Morris that are outside of the rotation. What are your thoughts on, let's start with Derek Jones Jr. Was Derek Jones Jr. the right call, and is he he's now solidified in that rotation? Yeah, I think when coming into this season, obviously people had different expectations of of where they saw him sliding into the rotation, but the defensive impact and the size that he brings, I think the size is, is key because there are multiple guys on this team that could have brought different sorts of defense that they could have gone with in that starting lineup, but they chose to stick with Derrick Jones Jr. because of the size and also I think the slashing ability and the veteran presence, a lot of a lot of things. And so and I'm sure you guys have discussed. And so I think it was the right call. I think he's looked phenomenal and you can see the the patience that he has. He's not necessarily out or the 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 self the unselfishness of his game, mm-hmm. I think is probably the best way to put it. Uh, he looks to be fitting in very well with that starting lineup and also kind of adds to the pace that they want to play with. Who do you think should play more? Who do you think should play less so far in this rotation? Uh, God, I'm going to get some heat for this. Um, who do I think should play more? I think Seth Curry should play more because I do think that there are times when certain lineups have a lack of sort of control and there's chaos. Mm. And I think Seth Curry is someone that could step right in, play with the pace, add some ball handling, still keep the high octane offense and the high level shooting, but also have this veteran presence to help keep things calm. I think right now what the Mavs are doing is a formula that clearly is is bringing them some success. And Seth Curry is obviously not playing consistently on a night-to-night basis. So do I expect that to happen? Not necessarily, but I do think that over time, if there starts to be maybe a trend in a negative direction, he could be a solid option to look at. Interesting. So far, I haven't seen where his fit is 
Seth Curry, because that, that is a player I thought for sure was going to have a role in the rotation. I mm-hmm. penciled in for like 15 minutes a game, like that fourth tier, like tied right. with like where Maxi and Dwight are right now as far mm-hmm. as minutes. And he just hasn't, he just hasn't really popped in that sense. He doesn't right. slightly have said this a bunch on our post games. He just doesn't take enough threes. He shoots really well right. from three. This year may tank his three point percentage, and that may be a thing he doesn't want. But you know, Tim Hardaway just lets it fly everywhere, and mm-hmm. they set up stuff for him. And he, you know, he's got that super green light. And Courage yeah. doesn't let it fly enough. I think they tried him as a ball handler in the preseason. I don't think they really liked what they saw with it. For me, the one that's got to play more is Exum. I think they. I think in the. I think Jason Kidd has figured that out because I think yeah. he can do some of those things that you were mentioning with the ball handling and he'll push the pace for sure. Keep that offense um, quick. And then so far this season, he's played what? 71 minutes. He has nine assists and one turnover and he had a good assist to turnover percentage in the, in the preseason too. So I think he's the one that should get some more time because I think he brings a lot. He's, he got some more, more time than Josh green in a couple of games recently. So I think that that, I think that's the one that has to play more, but you have to also have to pick somebody to play less. And that's kind of, Oh, it's kind of, Oh, that's kind of a tough one. It's not for me. <laughs> the person that I would like to see play less, again, not going to happen, is Dwight Powell. Because there are times when I am like trying not to pull my hair out with the finishing ability. Again, a lack of control. I, yeah. I do think that kind of also on the like play more. Personally, I would like to see a handful of his minutes go to Rashawn Holmes. I think Holmes does a, is underrated in a lot of aspects where people would like to see Dwight Powell excel in, I guess. But the reality is, is that these guys love playing with Dwight Powell. So that's not going to happen. Uh, But in terms of the lack of control, the size, the defense, the interior presence, there are times when I feel like the, the momentum really favors the other team when certain groups are out there. And a lot of times I do find that Dwight is a part of those groups. The other thing about those groups is that they play so small. They play like like four guards sometimes. They'll play mm-hmm. these Kyrie, Tim Hardaway, Josh Green, Ek, like Exo or, or Hardy sometimes lineups, and you're mm-hmm. like, what are you expecting to happen when you're playing like four, six, five, and under guys? You, you just think about some of the bigger teams or some of the wings off the bench that some teams have, and like they just play too small with that. So to me, I wonder if they, they tried at the beginning of the season playing – just Maxi at center, like a backup center. And I was like, ooh, that's kind of weird. Like, yeah. It's worked for some teams to play a smaller backup five. The, you know, the Bucks do it with Bobby Portis. The uh, Nuggets do it with Aaron Gordon, or they did it with Jeff Green last year. Like some of these teams play with like a smaller backup five, but it just wasn't working for the Mavericks because mm-hmm. of the way they get beat. I'd like to see a little more Dwight and Maxi if they're going to go with it. Like, let's, yeah. Let's play. If, the, if that's going to be the duo off the bench, those, gu- those guys have had some really good chemistry and they haven't played that many positions. I think it. I looked up earlier today while I was sitting in the airport and it was like 30 possessions or something like that. That's like nothing. They really haven't yeah. played that much together. And so I'd like to see that a little bit more, but then you're taking some minutes away from one of the, the guards or the wings. Right. To me, mm-hmm. I think, I, I think Tim Hardaway should play a little less because he, he's bringing a ton three point shooting. That's great. He just hurts you in a, a bunch of other different ways. Uh, he's been attacking the basket a little bit more this year, which is, which is mm-hmm. good. He's actually been finishing, which that part is, is good. Um, Defensively, he'll get charges, man. I think he's is he leading the league in charges still. I haven't checked he, after tonight's he was games, last but time I checked. he's he's getting a ton of charges. He got three in one game uh, the other night, but yeah, I think that's the one. Um, yeah, that's fair. Where we are. Do you think the rotation is set? Like, do you think this is what it is, or do you think you see any changes in Jason Kidd's future? You know, I can't say that I foresee significant changes. I think right now having Jaden Hardy, Dante Exum sort of fluctuating in terms of what what is needed is the right move right now. And Dante Exum, it, what we're seeing from him in terms of the inconsistency in his role, he consistently shows up with the effort, the strong defense, and trying to play with pace. He's, he's not hesitating on his open shots, which is a huge no. plus in my opinion. So he's doing all the right things. And you can't ask for much more from someone in a limited role like that. So I think having those two guys in whatever opportunity they get, both of them seem hungry and ready to go. And so that's sort of all you can ask for. We're really nitpicking at some of these. Like we're, we're talking, we're talking end of the bench guys. We're talking like yeah. a couple minutes here, a couple minutes there. I feel like the rotation has been pretty good. You know, I feel like Jason yeah. has really figured it out. Uh, Josh Green hadn't really hasn't really taken that step forward that I expected or hoped that he would this season, and so Derek Jones Jr. has been the right call, even though Josh is still playing more than him and finishes sometimes. But 
Uh, that that has been the right call. Uh, I think even the Jaden Hardy over Seth Curry, that may have been a surprise to some yeah. people, but I feel like that has been the right call because they needed somebody to attack and like slash and not be afraid to shoot some shots and to not be afraid yeah. to like take some insane shots. <laughs> you know, Jaden Hardy is not afraid to take some insane shots. And he gets the line a lot. That's something yeah. when, when Jaden Hardy gets in the game, he's averaging what? Two free throws a game in 12 minutes. <laughs> I think Kyrie is averaging like <laughs> three and a half in 33 minutes. Like you just think about that free throw rate compared. Like, like Hardy gets the line too, which I think adds a little bit to their to their team. Uh, but man, that's like small things we're talking about with this rotation. Mm-hmm. It is pretty set. Yeah, I think uh, I think what they've got going on is they found it pretty quickly and they found the balance. I think what you said about Dwight Powell and Maxi, I would really be intrigued to see that a little bit more and just find other ways to to have that be like to to fill in the gaps around them. I think that that could be interesting at some point. Uh, but right now, I feel like what you're seeing, and especially from Jaden Hardy, like you mentioned, the pace, the three point shooting, also just the way in which he scores, not just the fast break layups or you know, attacking the rim, but some of these step back threes that we see him just pull out of his bag, that's very difficult for someone at that age and and just considering his experience level. So for him, like you said, start or not starting him, but giving him minutes above Seth Curry is the right move, especially for his development. Um, so, you know, as much as I, I love Seth Curry and I'd love to see him get more minutes, like you said, there's just not a spot right now. And with the way Tim Hardaway Jr. is playing, and with the way Jaden Hardy, what with what he brings to the table and how Dante Exum is playing, again, you you find yourself nitpicking because overall the team is 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 performing well. I don't even think you know, in the in the offseason I would say, oh, if they trade Tim Hardaway Jr., they've got Seth Curry to you know step into that role. And I don't even like the way Tim Hardaway is playing. I don't know that I can say that right now that Seth would just yeah. slide right into that role right away because he's he's doing a lot and he's taking a ton of threes and he's making a bunch of them. The last one I would say, if there was any changes in in his future, to answer my question earlier, is maybe Omax towards the end of the season. Like that's maybe yeah, something we're looking at too. They they got him playing in the G League. They've got him. You know, he played three games in a row, three three games three days in a row, which I think is, I just think is funny, like an anecdote Wild. that you can mention. Uh, but they've got him playing in the G League, which I think is right. They got him taking twenty shots in that first game, which I think they need <laughs> him to just get used to the speed of the game and. He can make an impact. I, I really stu- still do believe in him, and I think if he follows the Jaden Hardy path of last season, of all right, I'm going to go through and Jaden Hardy didn't really play in, with the Mavericks until like December last year, and even then it was like mm-hmm. kind of back and forth. And then there were some injuries in a tra- in the trade, and then all of a sudden he got a, a little bit bigger role with the Mavericks. But yeah, maybe Omax because they still do need size. Like, he, mm-hmm. Kyrie said it the other night. You can't forget the loss to the Raptors, the loss to the Nuggets. Like they still have issues, even though they've been taking care of business in some of these games. Yeah, I think Omax, the size that he brings, kind of going back to when we were talking about Derek Jones Jr., you can't necessarily, like, the only other guy that has that sort of physical body type is Omax. And so, I mean, you never know when a trade is going to happen. You never know when an injury is going to happen. And so it would not surprise me at all if Omax, if all of a sudden some minutes clear up for him. Uh, and and, and with him playing uh, for the Legends, getting that confidence, confidence is the number one thing for rookies in my opinion and so for him to go go get those shots get the reps get just to see the belief uh in him i think is gonna is gonna go a long way for him so that way when the opportunity does present itself he's ready to step up absolutely there you go guys let us know in the comment section why do you think luca and Kyrie are working better you can let me know on twitter as well and uh, we'll be back tomorrow slightly and i will have the the post game for the pelicans show and we'll or for the Pelicans game, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, guys. Thanks for listening to Lockdown Mavs. Peace out. Boom.